Uh, what I'm going to present you today is our story, how we migrated our marketplace, our startup from running on virtual machines and uh, software developed in a living room to Switzerland's largest platform for legal services, which we are nowadays running on um, Google Cloud. So quickly about me, I've been in software engineering for almost 15 years. I've uh, been in startups since I was uh, pretty much 18 years old. And my experience with cloud environments mostly comes from um, AWS. So I haven't worked with Google Cloud before, and neither has my team. So we were all new to Google Cloud when we started this project. Get Your Lawyer, what is Get Your Lawyer? Get Your Lawyer is basically a marketplace for legal services. It means that a customer who has a legal issue, be it a divorce, a contract, whatever, files a request on our platform, after that, he gets up to free offers from specialized lawyers. He can hire the desired lawyer directly on the platform, and they can collaborate online by sharing documents, sending messages, and so on. The lawyer records all his work and his activity on our platform, and the customer can finally pay by credit card on the platform. Um, so we are handling all the financial transactions in the background. It's similar to Uber, Airbnb, and so on. Uh, it's a marketplace service. In the background, we have the service providers, the lawyers, and the customers uh, on the other side. Our platform consists of four applications, um, uh, law firm software for the lawyers, which we provide, the customer portal, an operations platform for our operations team, and the public part of the application. Our technology stack, well, our backend is pretty much written in uh, PHP. We have some services running in Node.js, like for example, for PDF generation. Our front end is now mostly written in Vue.js. Uh, we are currently still a monolith. Uh, we are transitioning towards a single page application with decoupled services in the backend. Uh, we are also quite closely integrated with uh, third party systems like SAP for accounting or IBM nodes. Our development team is working with Atlassian, so Jira, Bitbucket, and so on. So why did we migrate to Google Cloud? We are a startup. We always have a quite tight roadmap, so we don't have time for nice-to-have projects or something like that. So there really had to be a decision in the background when we decided to do that. Here you can see a comparison between our uh, infrastructure before on one virtual machine to now running on Google Cloud. As you can see, it's an improvement in pretty much every aspect. Um, especially important for us was scalability because we're running large media campaigns from time to time. So our application has to scale up and down pretty much automatically. We have to be able to handle the growth of our business without having to update our infrastructure every couple of months. Also the extensibility and ownership of the infrastructure is very important to us. So we are agile, our platform and our business is subject to frequent changes, which means that our development team needs to be able to update the infrastructure, maintain the infrastructure by ourselves without having to involve uh, system administrators and third parties every time. And finally, also reliability. Our customers are lawyers. And for lawyers, it's really, really important that their data is safe, that everything is always available, that there are no like downtimes or uh, crashes, security incidents, and so on. There's more. So summarizing it, you could summarize it under the hype buzzword DevOps. That's pretty much what we're in right now. Um, I'm a big fan of the 12-factor app principles, which you can see on the right. You could implement these principles as well on a legacy infrastructure running on virtual machines, but it's just perfect for a cloud environment. So on the environment which we are right now, we could really build the application architecture which we always intended to implement. So why did we decide for Google Cloud? Um, for us, the decision was really between AWS, to be honest, and Google Cloud. Microsoft Azure has never been really an option for us because from my point of view, it's just based on a different philosophy. It's more suited towards Microsoft solutions. 
and we are a big fan of open source. Well, one of the main reasons was that our data needs to be stored in Switzerland and AWS is not going to offer a Zurich region until 2022, as far as I know. So that was basically the main decision why we decided for Google Cloud. But then there's more. We decided to go with containers. So you needed a container orchestration tool, which is where Kubernetes is, is obviously the market leader. And then Google provides a great product, uh, Google Kubernetes engine, and is also the inventor, the mother of Kubernetes to say so. So from that background, the decision was rather easy and clear for us at the end. Let's have a look at our infrastructure before the migration. So I tried to compose a nice drawing of our infrastructure. It's not really my strength, so I hope you will still understand it. So this was our entire infrastructure before the migration. We had everything running on one small virtual machine managed by nine. So all our four applications, our backend services, our website, our uh, tools, like everything. Let's take a closer look. So we had three separated environments, production, stage, test, each with queue workers, cron jobs, web applications, each web application with four sub applications I mentioned before. We had backend services like databases, queue services, uh, supporting applications like PHP My Admin. We had Node.js running on this uh, virtual machine, PHP, the web server itself. We had uh, long running jobs on this virtual machine. So how did this all work on one virtual machine? I really have no clue. I think we were just lucky that it worked for such a long time. We recently ran into some serious problems, so the migration came just at the right time. This was pretty much our deploy pipeline. For the developers in here, I'm sure you will understand it. It's not actually a pipeline, it's just the bash script, which we executed on the virtual machine. It pretty much pulled the code from the repository, built everything, which took like 15 minutes. And during these 15 minutes, uh, our database was out of sync. Our static assets were out of sync, so our error logs filled up pretty fast within no time. We had to take the application down pretty much every time we wanted to deploy something because otherwise the customers would just see error pages. So it was actually quite terrible to work with this. What you can see here are some random screenshots from our Slack channel when it comes to Vagrant. We used Vagrant for local development. We tried to replicate the virtual machine as far as possible, which obviously we didn't even get close. We had problems with Vagrant pretty much all day, especially when it came to setting up a new developer. It took us like two days to get them up and running just because we had, especially on Windows, we had massive problems with uh, file systems and being out of sync, crashing all the time. It was just a huge mess. So let's take a look at our infrastructure now, as it is on Google Cloud. Um, I'm a big fan of the KISS and Yagni principles, which means keep it simple and stupid and you ain't gonna need it, which we also try to implement in the infrastructure on Google Cloud now. As you can see, we have an Nginx load balancer in the front, then we have three deployments. Uh, the queue workers, the platform, and the schedule runner. On the platform, we are running all our applications, all our web applications in one container because it's one code base. We can separate them later on. For now, it was just wasn't a requirement. We have the Google services, which we're using, manage Google services. And then we have services managed by Nine, like for the Kubernetes dashboard, for log aggregation, and so on. And all our code comes from the Bitbucket repositories. Uh, from the deployment pipelines, which I'm going to cover in the next slide. This is our uh, fully automated pipeline, our continuous integration pipeline. What happens is basically uh, we merge code to our uh, repositories using pull requests. And after that, our pipeline builds an image. It tests the image. It notifies all consumers like Slack and all our management tools and so on. Finally, it publishes the image in the Google Container Registry. Then our infrastructure repository gets updated with um, the hash of the latest image. It triggers Argo CD, our deployment tool, which then 
eventually pulls the image from the container repository and updates all our containers on the Google Cloud. So that's all fully automated. There is no manual interaction involved anymore. It's closely integrated with JIRA and it replicates pretty much our uh, development process. Nine usually works with GitLab. We decided to go with Bitbucket. Um, you can see here some screenshots from our Bitbucket uh, deploy tools and pipelines. The reason for that was simply the JIRA integration. So we heavily use JIRA. We have a quite complex uh, workflow set up in JIRA. And Bitbucket can hook in pretty much anywhere in JIRA. You can display data from Bitbucket in JIRA and the other way around. You can control everything from JIRA. And that makes it quite a nice feature for, for us. The pipeline feature is relatively new to Bitbucket. It doesn't exist for a long time, so it's not yet as fully fledged as GitLab is. But for us, it was just working fine. The integration is really nice. Our developers don't need to use multiple tools for their daily life. So it's really a decision we don't regret at all. And I can just recommend you to try it out, especially if you're working with Jira. Infrastructure as a code means that our entire infrastructure, so all our, like, let's say, load balancers, containers, deployments, everything, is controlled by uh, configuration files. And these configuration files are just part of our regular repositories, which means that our infrastructure is no longer a black box like it was before, where only your system administrators can do something in the infrastructure and you don't even know what's going on at all, especially not your developers. Now the entire infrastructure is controlled and owned by our developers. So we know everything which is set up and going on in our infrastructure. We can update and extend everything by ourselves. We control everything. And that makes it quite easy for us to uh, have the infrastructure growing together with our application without having to involve the support of Nine in this case all the time. We really only have to make use of the support if we do complex changes and um, extensions where we would have to dig into the, into the documentation too deep. We could theoretically do it, but it's not really worth it from my point of view. As a development environment, as a replacement for Vagrant, we are now using Docker Compose, which pretty much just spins up all our containers, which we also run on the cloud locally. Um, it works fine. The problem is, obviously, locally, you don't have Google Cloud services, the managed services like Cloud PubSub and Cloud SQL. And we didn't want to connect locally with uh, services running on the cloud for various reasons. So what we did is we tried to use the emulators provided by Google for their cloud services. The problem is the emulators weren't quite consistent. We couldn't get them working entirely. At the end, we just failed and we had to replace them with alternatives, like for example, just a Redis instance for um, as a replacement for the queues and for the memory store. It works just fine. The problem is that it's hard to test uh, issues which are specific to uh, Google Cloud services. We are not really yet entirely happy with this setup. Uh, we will probably replace and update it a bit with uh, something else in the future. Making the application cloud ready. So you cannot just take, usually you cannot just take your application, especially web application, and just deploy it to a cloud environment and have it running there. Because for example, if you look at uh, PHP, session handling, Session handling in PHP is based on uh, files, which are stored locally on the server. So as soon as you have multiple servers, your sessions would crash if the user request hits a different server on the second request and on the first request. Just as an example, so an application really has to be made cloud ready first. How did we do that? Well, lucky us, we used the proper framework from the beginning on, Laravel in this case, which is a really great framework, by the way. It theoretically provides everything you need out of the box. So it's based on adapters for all kinds of purposes like database, cache, message queues, and so on. You can just use an adapter for RabbitMQ, for Redis, for whatever you like, and update your configuration, and that should pretty much be it. So in theory, we just had to update our configuration files and deploy the application to the cloud. Obviously, it wasn't that easy. We had quite some issues. 
And for example, Google Cloud is not yet very popular amongst the Laravel PHP community. So the adapters available for Laravel were quite not that well supported to say so they had like three to five stars on uh, github we had to fork them we had to uh, fix and extend them by ourselves at the end we got it working but it wasn't really that nice and um, also like i said the services the google cloud services weren't available locally so it was quite hard to test everything and then also of course if you don't use a framework it doesn't help you so we had legacy modules where our developers used the uh, file system directly instead of using the framework for file system access. So we had to refactor that, of course. Um, there were some issues, but at the end, we got it working. The migration itself, um, we thought that this would be the hard, hardest part. It turned out to be rather easy and smooth. So. What we did was we, we scheduled the downtime of eight hours. At the end, it ended out to be just 28 minutes instead of eight hours. Of course, there was some security margin included, but still. What we did is we basically migrated our test and stage environments weeks before we migrate to production. So we could just create our uh, tests and test everything and just get some learnings from it to make sure we don't fail on the production migration. Also, what we did is we pre-synced all files and everything the day before the migration. So on the migration day, we just had to sync what was missing. And this was a pretty fast thing. We got it all working in 28 minutes, like I said before. There were some pitfalls and issues which we discovered early enough, lucky us, for example, timestamps. If you're using different time zones on your uh, legacy infrastructure, SQL, MySQL, then in um, your cloud environment, for example, it's going to convert all of your timestamps if you uh, dump and import the database, which was a problem for us because we were using hashes of the timestamps in our application. Oh, for example, third-party integrations. Uh, some integrations did whitelist our IP addresses so we could connect with them. And on the cloud, we didn't have or we don't have static IP addresses anymore, which means we had to find a workaround for that. Or also, if you use uh, your production database to spin up a test instance of the production environment to say so and test it there, you need to make sure to anonymize it first. Otherwise, you might end up sending out uh, emails twice or having jobs worked on twice if your application is running on two environments at the same time. So I'm personally a huge fan of checklists. I checklist everything. It's pretty much a hobby of mine. Um, I do checklists for pretty much everything in my life. And if it comes to something like migrating your application to the cloud, it's really something I would recommend you to do. Prepare a checklist of the migration itself and train it like once, twice at least with your test stage environment so you can absolutely make sure you're not going to have sleepless nights before the migration. Everything will just work out fine, hopefully. So let's get to the final part of my presentation, some challenges and lessons we learned from this entire project. First of all, we had to learn that Google Cloud is not AWS. As I said before, all our developers have mostly experience with AWS. And it turned out that some services work quite differently, even though they serve the same purpose. The community is different. The documentation is different. Also, the philosophy is kind of different. So we really had some time to get into this entire Google thing. Um, logs, for example, log files. So we were used to just searching through log files by using cat and grep, by searching through them, differentiating them by uh, file names. Now when using a log aggregation service, it's just a web interface where you have to get used to. Uh, I already spoke about external services. Another point worth mentioning is that running your application on a cloud environment may, might actually slow it down initially. Because imagine before we had a, a cache, a memcache, for example, running on the same machine as your application is running. 
and one page performs 5,000 requests to your memcache. Now, if on the cloud, your memcache is running on a different machine than your application is, you all of a sudden have the network overhead in between, which means 5,000 times the network overhead. And this is actually significantly slower than if you have both on the same machine. Another point I would really recommend you to do is get professional support by Nine, for example, um, because it's just very, very complex and it will take you a lot of time to get into everything. Of course, it's not like a black box. You as developers or IT professionals, you will be able to set up a cloud environment by yourself. But if you really want to have it secure and set up within reasonable time and using best practices, I would really recommend you to not try to do it by yourself. And well, third-party integrations, I already spoke about that. Networking on a cloud environment is networking on a legacy data center. Some integrations might not work anymore. Just consider that early enough. Self-managed services. So instead of using managed services by Google, for example, let's say cloud pops up for a message, uh, message queues, you could just spin up a RabbitMQ container. There's uh, fixed, there's uh, containers available and uh, use them instead of uh, cloud services. Of course, it has uh, disadvantages. For example, you need to uh, take care of backups, of redundancy, of uh, failover handling everything by yourself which would otherwise be managed by Google, but it's just more consistent with your local environment and it's easier to handle. It all depends a bit on your use case. Or let's say database migrations. Your database migrations need to hook in somewhere in the deployment process and they can possibly fail, which means that you need to roll back your entire deployment, possibly. Um, that's something you just need to consider and it's not that obvious. What I mean there with don't try to maintain a Ferrari with a team of Dacia technicians is just that um, a cloud environment, be it Google Cloud or AWS or whatever, is quite complex and it's not comparable to what your developers worked before with probably. So if your developers just worked on creating websites and HTML, CSS, or set up some VMware virtualizations, it will take a lot of time to get into everything. I already mentioned that. Uh, some applications probably would just not be worth migrating them because um, refactoring everything you need to refactor would take more time than to rewrite them. So really think about this carefully. And um, one thing which I should probably also mention is that an environment running on a cloud is going to be more expensive than your legacy. Uh, infrastructure initially, because you have replication of everything. Also, computing power isn't actually that cheap on Google Cloud or AWS. It's quite expensive. Um, you will have all the managed services where you need to pay for all the other uh, services like log aggregation and so on. So it only pays off once you actually scale up and down. And also, of course, all the advantage advantages I mentioned before in the other slide but this is just a pure financial aspect. And then um, one final advice from my side, Docker really is production ready. It works just fine. It's used in production by major companies like Google. So don't even consider running your applications on bare virtual machines anymore. It's just not, it's just not really not worth it. So that was it from um, my side, my part of the presentation. Any questions, Tom, from the community? Yes, so first one is from uh, Torben. So did you choose GCP over AWS only because of the region? Not only, but mostly, yes. As I mentioned before, we also cho uh, choose it because uh, Google for us is kind of the mother and the inventor of um, Kubernetes. And it also provides a great product, uh, Kubernetes engine. Uh, this is all like, Google is more native to uh, to containers and to Kubernetes than, for example, AWS is, but mostly because of the region, yes. The next question is from Dan. Could you please explain a bit more why you choose GCP over Azure? 
Well, that's more a philosophy question, I would say, than a, a, a decision based on facts. Uh, Azure for me is Microsoft, and Microsoft is closed source. It's more suited towards .NET. Of course, nowadays you really Google Cloud, Azure, and AWS pretty much provide all the same services, and you can get any application running on all of these F3 cloud providers. But for us personally, especially for me, it was kind of a philosophical decision because Microsoft traditionally is closed source, it's .NET, it's Windows, and AWS and Google are more towards open source Linux, which we are running on. So. Uh, that's the background of this decision. Okay, next question is from Daniel. Uh, what can you say about infrastructure costs before and after? Well, as I mentioned before, of course you cannot compare the cost of one virtual machine, which is probably a few hundred bucks a month, if not less, to an environment like we have now on Google Cloud. So the cost of such an environment is at least 10k per year if you and then you didn't even scale up that's just the bare minimum you're going to have including like an SLA uh, from a consultancy department like Nine for example uh, the cost of the Google Cloud services itself isn't that high but considering everything I would say that's about the minimum you need to spend so it really only pays off financial scene from the pure financial aspect as soon as you scale up and down Okay, thanks, Daniel. Wrote that uh, his question was answered in the talk. <laughs> so I should read all the questions before. Uh, next question is from uh, Dan. Is it a requirement that the local environment to, co to not connect to GCP? GCP dev environments should not be that costly. Uh, well, of course you can connect from your local development environment to uh, Google Cloud services. Um, for us, it wasn't about cost, it's, it was more about we wanted to have everything separated and also we wanted to have it working offline. So we, re we really wanted to be able to have our developers working in the airplane, from a beach, from anywhere in the world without having internet access without having to connect to any cloud services or something. We wanted to have it all here locally, fully under our control. That was the reason why we decided to not connect to cloud services from local environments. But of course it's an option. So then going to the last question from Martin. How good were you able to estimate the operating cost of the cloud infrastructure in advance? So we relied on the estimation of nine here. <laughs> um, no, I mean the upfront, the, the cost for the uh, for the setup of the project itself uh, was given before. Also, the SLA of nine and everything uh, we knew in advance. So the pure cost of the Google Cloud services is really, really hard to estimate, um, especially if you were running on uh, on one machine before. It's it's difficult, it really depends. We could estimate it more or less, it turned out to be pretty accurate, but I wouldn't say you can rely on that too much. Okay, so that was the last question. Mm -hmm.